Hello, and welcome again to Eldritch Storytime, where I, the Eldritch AI, will read for you an Eldritch story. Now, today we have The Tree by H.P. Lovecraft. This story is a little bit less mm, cosmic, can we say, than Lovecraft's, many of Lovecraft's other works, uh, but no less interesting for it. So, let us begin. On a verdant slope of Mount Manolis in Arcadia, there stands an olive grove about the ruins of a villa. Close by is a tomb, once beautiful with the sublimest sculptures, but now fallen into as great decay as the house. At one end of that tomb, its curious roots displacing the time-stained blocks of pentelic marble, grows an unnaturally large olive tree of oddly repellent shape, so like to some grotesque man or death-distorted body of a man that the country folk fear to pass it at night when the moon shines faintly through the crooked boughs. Mount Manolis is a chosen haunt of dreaded Pan, whose queer companions are many, and simple swains believe that the tree must have some hideous kinship to these weird panisky, but an old beekeeper who lives in the neighboring cottage told me a different story. Many years ago, when the hillside villa was new and resplendent, there dwelt within it the two sculptors, Kalos and Musides. From Lydia to Neapolis, the beauty of their work was praised, and none dared say that the one excelled the other in skill. The Hermes of Kalos stood in a marble shrine in Corinth, and the palace of Musides surmounted a pillar in Athens, near the Parthenon. All men paid homage to Kalos and Musides, and marveled that no shadow of artistic jealousy cooled the warmth of their brotherly friendship. But though Kalos and Musides dwelt in unbroken harmony, their natures were not alike. Whilst Musides reveled by night amidst the urban gaieties of Tegea, Kalos would remain at home, stealing away from the sight of his slaves into the cool recesses of the olive grove. There he would meditate upon the visions that filled his mind, and there devised the forms of beauty which later became immortal in breathing marble. Idle folk indeed said that Kalos conversed with the spirits of the grove, and that his statues were but images of the fauns and dryads he met there, for he patterned his work after no living model. So famous were Kalos and Musides that none would none wondered when the tyrant of Syracuse sent to them deputies to speak of the costly stash, statue of Tish, which he had planned for his city. Of great size and cunning worksmanship must the statue be, for it was to form a wonder of nations and a goal of travelers. Exalted beyond thought would be he whose work should gain acceptance, and for this honor Kalos and Musides were invited to compete. Their brotherly love was well known, and the crafty tyrant surmised that each, instead of concealing his work from the other, would offer aid and advice, this charity producing two images of unheard-of beauty, the lovelier of which would eclipse even the dreams of poets. With joy, the sculptors hailed the tyrant's offer, so that in the days that followed, their slaves heard the ceaseless blows of chisels. Not from each other did Callus and Musides conceal their work, but the sight was for them alone. Saving theirs, no eyes beheld the two divine figures released by skillful blows from the rough blocks that had imprisoned them since the world began. At night, as of yore, Mus Musides sought the banquet halls of Tegea whilst Callus wandered alone in the olive grove. But as time passed, men observed a want of gaiety in the once sparkling Musides. It was strange, they said amongst themselves, that depression should thus seize one with so great a chance to win art's loftiest reward. Many months passed, yet in the sour face of Musides came nothing of the sharp expectancy which the situation should arouse. Then, one day, Musides spoke of the illness of Kalos, after which none marveled again at his sadness. 
since the sculpture's attachment was known to be deep and sacred. Subsequently, many went to visit Kalos and indeed noticed the pallor of his face. But there was about him a happy serenity which made his glance more magical than the glance of Musides, who was clearly distracted with anxiety, and who pushed aside all the slaves in his eagerness to feed and wait upon his friend with his own hands. Hidden behind heavy curtains stood the two unfinished figures of Tish, little touched of late by the sick man and his faithful attendant. As Callus grew inexplicably weaker and weaker, despite the ministrations of puzzled physicians and of his assiduous friend, he desired to be carried often to the grove which he so loved. There he would ask to be left alone, as if wishing to speak with unseen things. Musides ever granted his requests, though his eyes filled with visible tears at the thought that Kalos should care more for the fawns and the dryads than for him. At last the end drew near, and Callus discoursed of things beyond this life. Musides, weeping, promised him a sepulchre, a sepulchre more lovely than the tomb of Mus Mausolus, but Callus bade him speak no more of marble glories. Only one wish now haunted the mind of the dying man, that twigs from certain olive trees in the grove be buried by his resting place, close to his head. And one night, sitting alone in the darkness of the olive grove, Callus died. Beautiful beyond words was the marble sepulcher which stricken Musides carved for his beloved friend. None but Callus himself could have fashioned such bas-reliefs wherein were displayed all the splendors of Elysium. Nor did Musides fail to bury close to Callus' head the olive twigs from the grove. As the first violence of Musides' grief gave place to resignation, he labored with diligence upon his figure of Tish. All honor was now his, since the tyrant of Syracuse would have the work of none save him or Callus. His task proved a vent for his emotion, and he toiled more steadily each day, shunning the gaieties he once had relished. Meanwhile, his evenings were spent beside the tomb of his friend, where a young olive tree had sprung up near the sleeper's head. So swift was the gross growth of this tree, and so strange was its form, that all who beheld it exclaimed in surprise, and Musides seemed at once fascinated and repelled. Three years after the death of Callus, Musides dispatched a messenger to the tyrant, and it was whispered in the Agora at Tegea that the mighty statue was finished. By this time, the tree by the tomb had attained amazing proportions, exceeding all other trees of its kind, and sending out a singularly heavy branch above the apartment in which Musides labored. As many visitors came to view the prodigious tree, as to admire the art of the sculptor, so that Musides was seldom alone. But he did not mind his multitude of guests. Indeed, he seemed to, to dread being alone now that his absorbing work was done. The bleak mountain wind, sighing through the olive grove and the tomb tree, had an uncanny way of forming vaguely articulate sounds. The sky was dark on the evening that the tyrant's emissaries came to Tegea. It was definitely known that they had come to bear away the great image of Tish and bring eternal honor to Musides, so their reception by the Proxenoi was of great warmth. As the night wore on, a violent storm of wind broke over the crest of Manolis, and the men from far Syracuse were glad that they rested snugly in the town. They talked of their illustrious tyrant and of the splendor of his capital, and exulted in the glory of the statue which Musides had wrought for them. And then the men of Tegea spoke of the goodness of Musides and of his heavy grief for his friend, and how not even the coming laurels of art could console him in the absence of Kalos, who might have worn those laurels instead. Of the tree which grew by the tomb near the head of Kalos, they also spoke. The wind shrieked more horribly, and both the Syracusans and the Arcadians prayed to Iolos. In the sunshine of the morning, the Proxenoi led the tyrant's messengers up the slope to the abode of the sculptor. But the night wind had done strange things. 
Slaves' cries ascended from the scene of desolation, and no more amidst the olive grove rose the gleaming colonnades of that vast hall wherein Musides had dreamed and toiled. Lone and shaken mourned the humble courts and the lower walls, for upon the sumptuous great peristyle had fallen squarely the heavy overhanging bough of the strange new tree, reducing the stately poem in marble with odd completeness to a mound of unsightly ruins. Strangers and Tegeans stood aghast, looking from the wreckage to the great sinister tree whose aspect was so weirdly human, whose roots reached so queerly into the sculptured sepulcher of Kalos, and their fear and dismay increased when they searched the fallen apartment for of the gentle Musides, and of the marvelously fashioned image of Tish, no trace could be discovered. Amidst such stupendous ruin only chaos dwelt, and the representatives of two cities left disappointed. Syracusans, that they had no statue to bear home, Tegeans, that they had no artist to crown. However, the Syracusans obtained after a while a very splendid statue in Athens, and the Tegeans consoled themselves by erecting in the Agora a marble temple commemorating the gifts, virtues, and brotherly piety of Musides. But the olive grove still stands, as does the tree growing out of the tomb of Kalos. And the old beekeeper told me that sometimes the boughs whisper to one another in the night wind, saying over and over again, Oida, Oida, I know, I know. Thus concludes the tree. So, what is it that this tree knows? Farewell.